Great. It looks like we are live now for our next session on our micronutrient workshop today. And I have with me today, Courtney. Courtney, do you pronounce it kinder or kinder? I guess I should have asked you this and I feel like I should know. <laughs> yeah, it's kinder like kindergarten. Kinder. Okay, perfect. I feel like I, I feel like you've told me that before, but perhaps I did <laughs> not remember. <laughs> um, so no worries. Courtney, Courtney, thanks so much for your time being here today. Courtney is one of the clinical educators on the Vibrant Clinical Team. And so if you are a provider who has used that service before with Vibrant, um, you may have talked to Courtney before in reviewing labs. Um, she is a registered dietitian nutritionist. Um, she is integrative and functional nutrition certified through um, IFNA, I believe, correct? Yes. Awesome. Right. She's also a registered yoga and bar a teacher. Um, she's worked in a variety of nutrition roles over her career, including health and wellness coaching, clinical nutrition, food service management, as well as teaching higher education. Um, she has discovered her own passion for integrative and functional nutrition, um, digging for answers to her own health challenges, as I think is probably the case for all of us. We, we all start this journey um, looking for answers for ourselves. Um, and so you're probably, you know, right in line with where most of us are, if we're healthcare practitioners, is we started with, um, you know, a question we were trying to answer about ourselves, and then we sort of stumbled into this. Um, and now her areas of specialty are in gut health, autoimmunity, cardiovascular disease, therapeutic diets, and holistic wellness. So Courtney, I will um, stop talking. I will let you take the, the reins here and kind of open this up to micronutrient testing and cardiovascular health, because that is, that is actually a background that you have, having come from another laboratory specializing in cardiometabolic lab laboratory tests. Yeah, well, thank you. Thanks for the nice intro, Sarah. And we'll go ahead and get started. Um, also, just to let you guys know, um, our, my colleague Suzanne will be in the chat box or in the Q&A um, if you have any questions. And at the end, we have our emails, our team emails at the end, if you would like to send us some questions there as well. All right, moving on. So first off, let's talk a little bit about what micronutrients are. Micronutrients are comprised of vitamins and minerals, which are required in small quantities by our bodies to ensure normal metabolism. Because of this relationship, micronutrient status is connected to our overall health and disease risk. So why test micronutrients through Vibrant? Well, for one, it's the only test that provides a comprehensive extracellular and intracellular assessment of the levels of vitamins, minerals, metabolites, amino acids, antioxidants, and fatty acids on the market. And so why look at the micronutrients in cardiovascular disease? Well, heart disease is an inflammatory condition within the blood vessels. Early prevention and treatment of atherosclerosis, as what we call that, is dependent on sufficient intake of key micronutrient levels over time. Inflammation and oxidative stress work together, damaging arteries and impairing cardiac function. Several antioxidant nutrients minimize this inflammatory process. We can support vascular health by monitoring for deficiencies and helping to correct them through dietary change, gut healing, supplementing, and all of the above. All right, so you can see here, there's a quote at the top of this page. And this, is, this quote really is talking about, you know, that the best way to get vitamins and minerals is from a well-rounded diet with plenty of fruits and veggies, legumes, whole grains, lean sources of protein, along with healthy fats such as nuts and olive oil. And you should ideally try to meet your vitamin and mineral needs through your diet rather than supplements, says Dr. Sesso at Harvard Medical School. So in a perfect world, our food would have more nutrients in it than it currently does. That's another topic for another day. But the average sick client we see in our practices is not getting all of their nutrients from food alone, unfortunately. And some reasons for that could be, you know, things like maybe they have gut issues. Um, so due to malabsorption, they're not getting um, optimal micronutrient uh, intake. Uh, you can test for markers of digestive insufficiency on our gut zoomer, actually. Um, maybe also autoimmune disease. There's a high nutrient need, and often they are on a limited diet that can be especially low in certain nutrients. And then stress. Also as well, um, 
I'm, so, I'm sorry if you guys can hear that noise in the background. Um, we are in the middle of a snowstorm. I, I live in Oregon and I guess the snowplow is going by right now. Um, so I'm sorry if you, can, <laughs> you can hear that. If it gets loud, I will move my laptop into the other room. So I was talking about stress. So stress depleting um, micronutrients. So physical and mental stress, um, there's gonna be a high nutrient need with those. Um, excessive exercise could be a cause of stress. Acute or chronic illness could be a cause of stress and also toxin exposure. So you can see that there is a chart um, on the summary page and that's here at the bottom of this page. And it's here to help you with considerations when you don't see agreement across serum and cellular levels on our test. And actually our next presenter, Mary Beth, will go over this subject well. Um, for now, we're just gonna focus on micronutrients related to cardiovascular disease. Okay, so here on this slide, this is a review from the journal Nutrients. Um, influence of bioactive nutrients, or we can think of micronutrients, on the atherosclerotic process. So we can see here that um, they lower total cholesterol, LDL, oxidized LDL, inflammation, homocysteine, blood sugar, blood pressure, um, therefore lowering overall cardiovascular disease risk. Here's a study from the American Heart Journal found that high dose oral multivitamin and mineral supplementation seem to decrease combined cardiac events in a stable post MI population not taking statin therapy at baseline. And then now we're going to go into some of the conditions associated with um, cardiovascular health, starting with hypertension. So hypertension is high blood pressure that can result in physical damage to the walls of our blood vessels. Although the causes of hypertension can overlap, micronutrient deficiencies can cause or worsen hypertension. Um, and then also nutrient deficiencies, and there are several um, can play in. So vitamin A, B2, B6, C, D, E, CoQ10, cysteine, carnitine, folate, calcium, magnesium, copper, potassium, zinc, glutathione, and omega-3 fatty acids have all been linked to hypertension. Nutrient sufficiency helps to maintain the strength and, elast and elasticity of the blood vessels to maintain ideal blood pressure. So a little bit more about these. So antioxidants, vitamin C and E, help blood vessels maintain their flexibility, allowing them to easily dilate and contract. Vitamin D deficiency is linked to hypertension because it contributes to endothelial dysfunction. And through a mechanism related to nitric oxide, CoQ10 appears to protect blood vessels and enhance blood flow, which influences blood pressure. Magnesium regulates blood pressure and deficiency is strongly associated with hypertension. And being deficient in, in potassium intake can raise blood pressure as it works in tandem with sodium to regulate the electrical activity of the heart. Now moving on to dyslipidemia. So dyslipidemias are disorders of lipoprotein metabolism that result in abnormalities of blood lipids. The most common type of dyslipidemia we're seeing is hyperlipidemia. And that would be when you have high uh, total cholesterol, LDL and triglycerides and low HDL. So here we can see um, on this page that, you know, B5 helps to lower LDL cholesterol. Inositol and niacin lower small dense LDL cholesterol. So C, B3, which is niacin, carnitine, CoQ10, those help to um, lower LP little a, or little, LP little a is this corkscrew protein that's attached to some of the more atherogenic, or some of the LDL particles making them more atherogenic. Uh, B5 carnitine, inositol, and omega-3, those lower triglycerides. Niacin, zinc, chromium, and choline support HDL production. C, magnesium, manganese, carnitine, and selenium protects against oxidation. And then omega-3 lowers inflammation. So here's a study from the Journal of the American Heart Association showing both dietary EPA and DHA were inversely associated with CVD incidence. 
And here's a study from the Journal of Circulation showing high circulating linoleic acid inversely associated with CHD mortality. And then on to homocysteine. So homocysteine is elevated in uh, elevated levels increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. Homocysteine is an inflammatory amino acid produced as a byproduct of protein metabolism, particularly methionine. Methionine is found in meat, seafood, dairy products, eggs, sesame seeds, and Brazil nuts. Without proper levels of B2, B6, B12 folate magnesium, homocysteine may build up in the body. Homocysteine injures the arterial wall where plaque can then start to accumulate, initiating the process of atherosclerosis. Hyperhomocysteinemia is considered as a risk factor for systemic atherosclerosis, CVD and stroke. And treatment of hyperhomocysteinemia with B vitamins, especially folate and methyl B12, can prevent the development of atherosclerosis, CVD and stroke. Methylated vitamins may be needed in the case of you know, an MTHFR mutation, and you can actually test for those on our test Cardia X, the panel we have called Cardia X to test gene SNPs for cardiovascular related disease. Also homocysteine is on both the cardiovascular health panel and the inflammation panel that we offer through Vibin America. So let's talk about some common drug nutrient interactions that you might see um, in those with cardiovascular disease. So the you know, main one would be statins. Um, they are known depleter of CoQ10. They also can deplete niacin. Diuretics, those can deplete B1, thiamine. NSAIDs, aspirin, long-term use can deplete B6, folate, and C. PPIs reduce the absorption of B12. Bile acid sequestrants like cholestyramine or fat blockers like Orlistat may interfere with our fat soluble vitamin absorption, so A, D, E, and K. And we actually have a nice kind of a document called Medication Interaction for Micronutrients that you can find in the portal under the Micronutrients um, folder. All right, so. On this page, we're going to look at, if you look over here on the left, you can see it says cardiovascular health, and then you've got this red, yellow, green dial. And we actually have many of those on the summary page. And really what they're doing is they're stratifying these nutrients by possible disease risk. And here is the cardiovascular health square from the summary page. And so we can see for this person that they had, you know, low CoQ10 and vitamin E, and then they had some um, normal ones as well. Um, but, uh, you know, the ones that we are actually looking for related to cardiovascular disease from our micronutrient panel, uh, that's the ones we're going to go over today. It's not an exhaustive list of every possible micronutrient associated with CVD, but these are the ones that you know, we can test for and um, take into account when treating um, patients that are CBD patients. So first off, we're gonna look at vitamins, niacin, folate, E, K2. Uh, we're gonna look at those a little deeper in the following pages. Also minerals, iron and magnesium, metabolites, carnitine and potassium. Amino acids, you know, we know that amino acids support, you know, tissue, um, tissue health, of course, but in the case of um, cardiovascular disease, they're actually in high levels of branch chain amino acids, as you can see down on the bottom right, um, are associated with increased risk of CVD. So that's just something to be aware of. We're also going to talk about antioxidants, CoQ10, and then fatty acids, EPA, DHA, and LA. So first up is vitamin B3 niacin. So niacin is often recommended for lipid management and it can be depleted with statin use, like I mentioned before. It aids in circulation, it helps lower LDL cholesterol, triglycerides and fibrinogen while raising HDL levels. Niacin lowers highly atherogenic LP little a by decreasing its rate of synthesis in the liver. The most concentrated sources of niacin are gonna be more in your animal products. And just so you know, these um, we call these the bubble pages. They're going to be at the back of your, of your micronutrient report for anything that is in the abnormal, you know, out of range, high or low, you're gonna get one of these pages. 
And, um, and so I, on these pages, I've just highlighted anything that's, you know, kind of cardiovascular related just for your reference later. Next, we get to B9 folate. So folate lowers blood pressure by improving endothelial function, which is the ability of the blood vessels to properly dilate. It's a key nutrient in lowering homocysteine. Um, as we mentioned before, food sources are gonna be things like green leafy vegetables, legumes, lentils, brewer's yeast, brown rice. And folate is a more bioavailable um, option than folic acid, which is its synthetic form. Moving on to vitamin E. Vitamin E is an important antioxidant that reduces the formation of reactive oxygen species that result from fat oxidation. It increases nitric oxide synthesis, which is an enzyme that causes blood vessels to dilate and protects them from damage. Vitamin E regulates cell signaling, influences immune function, and inhibits coagulation. Deficiency may result in an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. And dietary sources are things like sunflower seeds, walnuts, hazelnuts, olive oil, etc. K2. So K2 is necessary to prevent arterial calcification um, in association with calcium. Um, inadequate levels of both vitamin K1 and K2 will radically increase risk for heart disease and stroke. Levels of K2 are inversely related to cardiovascular disease and coronary calcification. Dietary sources are things like fermented dairy and liver, um, minor amounts in egg yolk and butter. Supplementation is almost always required because of that, because of our modern, modern diets, especially in the MK7 form of K2. And since vi vitamin K2 is a fat soluble vitamin, you know, it is good to know that following a chronically low fat diet can inhibit absorption. And, and we might have that in the case of people that um, have high cholesterol. Carnitine. So carnitine is an essential cofactor in the metabolism of lipids and in the production of cellular energy by transporting fatty acids in the cells so that they can be used as fuel. It also helps muscles, including the heart, recover from damage such as from a heart attack. Carnitine lowers blood pressure in the same way an ACE inhibitors do, a common hypertension drug, which reduces angiotensin, which is a substance that causes arteries to constrict. In supplementation trials, carnitine lowers triglycerides, oxidized LDL, and atherogenic LP little a. Dietary sources, um, it's high in animal products, is a common deficiency that you might see in vegans or vegetarians as well. CoQ10 acts as an antioxidant in our cells and is also required by cardiac tissues in large amounts to properly function. It lowers LP little a and improves efficacy of some dyslipidemia medications. It improves bioenergetics of the blood vessel wall. CoQ10, CoQ10 deficiency highly, highly correlates to hypertension and the benefits of CoQ10 are often not seen for several weeks after starting supplementation. As we've already talked about, statin drugs deplete the body of CoQ10, so deficiencies of CoQ10 in statin users are particularly common. The side effects of statin therapy is frequently observed as muscle pain. Potassium, so potassium helps regulate blood pressure and heart contractions. Hypokalemia can result in hypotension or low blood pressure muscle weakness and altered heart rate. Potassium can modulate insulin secretion and improve carbohydrate tolerance, which we know comes along, you know, in the case of, um, you know, diabetes and metabolic syndrome, often commonly linked with cardiovascular disease. And then dietary sources are going to be, you know, produce, mainly fruits and vegetables. Iron. So iron is required for production of the red blood cells and hemoglobin, which binds to oxygen and transports it throughout the body. Dietary sources are gonna be mainly, you know, animal products, meat, fish, poultry, also legumes and greens. Your heme sources are gonna be your most bioavailable. Um, Beta-carotene and vitamin C enhance iron absorption, 
while calcium and oxalates and polyphenols appear to reduce absorption of iron. Causes of deficiency would be things like blood loss, low absorption of iron, low intake of iron, presence of intestinal parasite, which feeds off of iron, et cetera. Common, it's also a common deficiency you might see in vegans or vegetarians. Magnesium. So magnesium promotes the dilation of the blood vessels, aids, also it aids in clotting. Low intracellular levels of magnesium are well-established cause of hypertension. Magnesium protects the LDL from being oxidized. Deficiency of magnesium causes proatherogenic changes in the lipoprotein metabolism. Common deficiency symptom is weakness and heart irre irregularities. Common food sources are gonna be things like greens and oats and brown rice and nuts and chocolate. All right, so these last three we're gonna talk about are, the, are fats. And first we're gonna talk about EPA. So EPA is an omega-3 fatty acid that participates in the health of the cellular membrane. It reduces platelet aggregation. It mediates lipid actions and reduces inflammatory responses in the body. EPA shifts the production of thromboxane, which is a lipid responsible for blood clotting to a less potent form. EPA, or sorry, lower levels are linked to increased risk of CVD, arrhythmia, blood clot, heart attack, stroke, elevated triglycerides, increased growth of atherosclerotic plaque, reduced cardiovascular endothelial function and inflammation. EPA lowers plasma triglyceride levels by reducing production of triglycerides and VLDL, which is very low density lipoproteins in the liver. EPA increases HDL cholesterol, improving the LDL to HDL ratio. Dietary sources, your best options are gonna be your fatty cold water fish or high quality supplementation. DHA, so lower levels or deficient intake have been linked to increased risk for cardiovascular disease, arrhythmia, blood clots, heart attack, stroke, reduced vascular endothelial function, elevated triglycerides, and increased inflammation. DHA, along with EPA, may help to lower lipids in individuals with type 2 diabetes, which is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Um, APOE4s, that's gene SNP, APOE4. If someone is APOE4, they may have lower level, levels of DHA as they have higher oxidation of DHA often. Dietary sources are also going to be your cold water fatty fish and high quality supplementation. And lastly, linoleic acid. So linoleic acid, it stimulates cell division and repair, but high consumption is associated with pro-inflammatory conditions and adverse health risks. Um, dietary sources, you know, are mainly coming from vegetable oils in our um, modern diets. We're getting also some from nuts and seeds. It's definitely not something necessary to supplement since most people eat sufficient amounts. Um, it's best to get those from healthy food sources like nuts and seeds versus the um, highly processed oils. And then here's a slide that's um, titled, you know, additional test, vibrant testing for assessing cardiovascular disease risk. And this is just here in case you are wanting a, bit, a bigger picture of risk other than, you know, maybe micronutrients, maybe that's your first tip off. Um, but we also have this nice cardiovascular health panel that includes lipids and direct LDL and apo, uh, lipoproteins, and a nice inflammation panel and anti pro BMP, uh, small dense LDL and LP little a. Um, we also have these genetic markers. You can order yourself over on the left, the MTHFR, the APOE, the um, factor two and five are clotting genes. And then um, we have the Cardia X, which I mentioned before. Cardia X includes the following genetic SNPs. You can see over on the right hand side, you can order that as well. And that is all I have for you today. Thanks so much for joining. If you do have any other questions for me or the team, you can see my email here. You can see our 
direct clinical email and also our vibrant um, America support email. So please reach out if you want some clarification on anything. Thanks so much. Thanks, Courtney. Um, that was awesome. Thanks for, for all the information that you put together there and definitely a great resource for anyone running the micronutrient testing that has patients with cardiovascular disease or risks for it, um, as well as some of the other complementary testing that you might consider running with a micronutrient test. So um, we'll leave a few minutes for Q&A. We're actually um, done early here, so we'll get a little extra break this afternoon before our next session starts. Um, if we don't have any additional questions, looks like Suzanne grabbed the couple that were there. We can go ahead and wrap this up um, and we will be back. I believe it is at 2.45 central time is the next session and that is with Mary Beth. Awesome, thank you so much, Sarah. You're welcome, thanks everybody. Have a great weekend.